Hi, um, so this is the much promised Grin Live. I have tried to do this a couple of times and have failed for various technical reasons prior to now. Um, but I finally got it working and I am very excited because I have a super duper special guest who I have been trying to get on this show as far insofar as it's an actual show. Um, I've been trying to get to do this with me for um, almost as long as um, Hangouts on the Air has existed. Uh, in fact, she is the very first person that I thought of when I thought that I might want to do this for my channel. So, um, oh crap, I'm getting an echo. Ah, oh, there it is. Okay. Um, so that was technically awkward. Uh, anyway, so I um, I finally have Morgan from translabyrinth.com and since I really don't know all the things about myself, the fact of the matter is if you know who I am, you know who she is, and you have almost certainly subscribed to her channel, and like me, you've been desperately missing her uh, while she's been touring the Himalayas seeking enlightenment. I think that's where she's been. Um, but she's back on the internet now, and she's joined us here. Say hi. Say hi. <laughs> she's adorable, right? No. Um, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes, and I'm so sorry for the delays. She, Bryn totally took it onto herself and said, oh, technical thingy, technical thingy. No, no, All lies. I have like a 30-minute walk home, and in our dearest, dearest capital of our dearest, dearest country, it decided that clear sky should transition suddenly into lots and lots of storming and then and then the water and the cars and the onto my possessions and the need to dry my hair and the change of the clothes. And now, now, as I have been taught for many years, I have nestled my cell phone inside a cozy bed full of uncooked rice. And hopefully that will extract out all the water so I don't have to pay the obscene price that the cell phone costs all over again. And um, I suppose... I should just blame the patriarchy on this, as I do all things. Shakespeare's menacingly. It was it was a difficult transition then from the clear weather. See, I knew, I knew when I said that, that I was rather damning myself to commentary. Well, if anyone's going to go with a cheap trans joke, it's me. So, um, you really should have known better. You are cheap. And Todd. I'm winking. And Todd, I think you should know. Um, yeah, wait till I see the uh, after our special after this. It's going to be live after dark. She's bashful. You keep cutting out. <laughs> I, I I'm super flirty, which sometimes throws people off. Mm -hmm. um, no, I was just, no, just going to say that... Um, Oh no, are we talking over me? Oh no, are we both talking over each other? Is this the actual fable technical difficulties? I can't tell. No, I think this is probably just what our phone conversations sound like to anybody else. <laughs> no, it's funny, like, I come off, like, really, like, sweet in, like, videos and stuff, and I, I guess I am. I don't think people are allowed to say that they're sweet, so I'm not going to do that. Sweet. But I'm it's okay. I'll, I'll for you. you, you, no, but I'm super flirty in real life. Like, just as a way to make people feel comfortable, which works for 99% of people that I know, but there's every now and then the 1% of person who, um, you know, uh, would like to run away. <laughs> <laughs> I'm warm. You Come are... into my cozy, nestled arm grasp thing, which Bren has yet to experience because we have never yet been in the same city at the same time. Yeah, this is actually the closest we've ever been to um, speaking face-to-face. -face. We've only ever spoken on the phone or sent videos, and that's about it. So, you know, yay Google and technology, and it's almost like a hug. Here, have a hug. Oh, for you too. Yeah, this must look creepy to the viewer. <laughs> yeah, I think we've just completely creeped out any two people who are actually watching this. Um... <laughs> Like the stream is not updating for me. Uh -huh. Hmm. I don't know why. That's frustrating. Okay. Um. So I'm gonna have to pop back and forth to Twitter, I think, for um comments. But if you do have comments, um, go to the um YouTube page and leave us a comment there. Um. 
or you can send a tweet um, with hashtag BrynLive, and we will find that and we will see it. So send us your questions and your comments. Um, OK, so back to you. Um, so you and I actually started doing videos right around the same time, and one of us had meteoric success. Um, well deserved, and um, this is the sound of me rolling my eyes. And one of us was me. Um, no, but actually, it was really great because it, you were so delightfully clear and open and um, cheerful about your transition and just about being trans in general. And um, I've made no secret of the fact that you are one of my trans role models. Um, and that I, I absolutely look up to you. And you know, um, Morgan is younger than me by more years than I'd like to admit. Uh, and I learn something from her every time we talk. Um, I, I just think she's absolutely fascinating. Um, so I wanted to know who you found to be um, inspiring. Who's your, who's your trans role model? Well, first of all, I'd like to say that I really wish the camera would flip over when I blushed, which would have been the entire time, so no one would have seen you talking anyway, so never mind, I didn't want that at all, but thank you, you're just a big sweetie, and I've loved talking to you all these years, and I'm so sad that it's taken us this long to actually get um, webcam to webcam. Um, if I had to quantify my trans role models, I'd pick two people and then one kind of odd source. Um, so the first person I pick is a uh, trans model named uh, Carolyn Cossey, who uh, was in the, you can see her at a swimming pool scene in the James Bond film, the first of the Roger Moore films, Live and Let Die. And uh, when I first um, started looking into trans stuff online when I was in middle school, she was like one of the first people that came up and she was gorgeous and no one knew and she... Um, did topless stripping on the side to pay for her surgery, and she was just really strong, but had to like keep everything it was that she was doing very much under wraps because this is this is the time at which you know the closest word that people had for trans people was transvestite, and it was like a oh god, oh god, I broke it like, all. Mental efficiency. Now, sorry, what did you say, honey? Um, I I think there was a yeah. There was a, a hiccup or something. So um, the only word that people had at the time was transvestite. Oh yeah. So um, back during the time where this, I guess, was the '70s, where Carolyn Cossey was like modeling. Um, you know, it wasn't exactly the same as kind of our, you know, blogging every bit of our history that it is right now, where you could just like talk about like what a great triumph this one was for her, because no one probably would have wanted to know it, or the people who would have would not have you know, admitted to being the people who would have wanted to hear about her story. So it just kind of, it's just one of those things that, um, that you know, if you do enough internet research, you run across her, and she was gorgeous and fabulous, and I thought, and you know, I mean, like, a lot of what, a lot of what I understood being trans as growing up, and for, and for most of my life, I mean, for, for wanting to be a girl, it wasn't like, oh, I want to go, I want to act like this and say these things and have these kinds of interactions with people and engage my femininity in X, Y, Z ways. It was, I would like to look like that, like this really, really pretty person. And so I just admired her so much. And when Autostraddle interviewed me for the big calendar girl spread, I made sure to name drop her because um, I just like, I will find as many opportunities as I can when talking about trans stuff to mention people like her who are, you know, the real pioneers who are way ahead of us, whose stories had to be told years later on. And I, you know, I'm sad for that, but I'm glad that they're being told at all. And then if I had to pick a second person, it'd be Andrea James, who did tsroadmap.com, which, man, <laughs> I mean, as far as a Wikipedia for the trans female experience, I couldn't have asked for a better one. And it was just hundreds upon thousands of articles that were as much her as they were user input, which was really great for me because that I was hearing so many different trans people's experiences. And I actually really appreciate that most of the people who were posting there were from a time where things were so much harder, comparatively speaking, as they are to now. Because I think I benefited a lot from hearing the worst possible outcome of Thank you. 
who you are and just, you know, but still being who you are anyway. It's like, I mean, that was really powerful to me to see all these people who'd lost so much and could still, you know, stay who they were. Because, I mean, you know, like now we live in a kind of like more middle ground trans experience where there's more things that we have accessible, like, you know, the Equal Opportunity Employment Commission going to bat for trans people or, you know, actual end um, employment discrimination stuff entering into law and the conversation and things like the Oregon Equality Bill or the birth certificate um, changing bill that just passed through D.C. through a friend of mine um, that makes it easier for trans D.C. residents to change their birth certificates without like all the mucky mucky fuss which is you know they're ahead of the game and doing that um, in front of a lot of states but that this kind of legislation just didn't exist outside of like SoCal um, and North Cal I guess and so and then actually, I also owe a debt to porn. For the same reason, as for Carolyn Cossie, it's just that there wasn't, when I was in middle school, which is in, like, um, you know, mid to late 90s, I guess, um, there wasn't, there wasn't like, a lot of, like, trans resources online. There was just, if you typed in trans people, you got lots of porn. And so it at least gave me some universe in which I could imagine that, you know, I could be as possibly attractive as, you know, all these women. And, you know, that's uh, the whole... The whole porn industry conversation in relationship to trans people is an entirely other thing. But, you know, that they were there and that they were beautiful and that there was an image that I could hold on to my mind and I kept it secret and deep inside myself and I would dream about it right before I knew I was about to fall asleep where I would feel the least guilty about dreaming about it. And I just held on to that for years and years and years in the same way I held on to the August Federal Calendar Girls thing when I first found it because it's just like... You know, it seemed impossible, but there was a small part of me that thought maybe, just maybe, like, I could turn out not looking like a hairy, shambling, deep-voiced, odd mess, you know, and, like, just, you know, and I'm sad that I had to limit myself to just, you know, one notion of the way an attractive person can look, but that I had, that there were trans women at all online, you know, I would have taken that over nothing. I would have taken that over typing it into, what did we use back then, Alta Vista, Lycos, Excite. I would have taken that over typing. What did you say? I said, go get it, boy. Yeah. So I would have taken that over typing things into those search engines back then and just getting nothing back. So I, you know, I know a debt of gratitude to those women regardless of what, you know, their experiences were and maybe they were mixed and maybe they weren't. But, you know, at least they were there. I mean, that's the thing is, um, that's why I started writing articles under my own name a couple years ago because I was like, there just been so many people who don't use their name and, I still like signing my all my articles with with love M because that's you know who's the best. But uh, um, I'm sorry, my dog has gone crazy. <laughs> that's okay. I was pretty much out of things to say. So your puppy was pretty much calling me time like at the Oscars when they're out of time for the awards. Uh, no, she's not playing you off. She's being ridiculous. Anyway. I'm sorry about that. Um, so, oh, it's no problem. It's no problem. Uh, so porn was, what it was, was your uh, inspiration, was what I heard out of all of that. Well, it helped. It was better, yeah, than, it was yeah. better, than, it was better than finding nothing um, online. Uh, <laughs> what, what are the you know what? You made a face, and I don't know if the camera caught you making that face, but you, I'm shaking my finger. Um, the commenter said that there was a discrepancy in our um, audibility and that you are really loud. Oh. So I wonder, I moved my mic closer. Does that make it better? Let's see. Um, I'm going to move my computer further away. That helps. And we can just see more of you. Yeah. <laughs> um, let's see. I, I'm trying to bring up the YouTube comments because... Uh, because reasons. <laughs> because reasons. Because reasons. I wonder what the English language is going to be like in 50 years at this rate. Uh, frightening. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that's what it's going to be, is unrecognizable and frightening. No, I think that um, language is probably changing so much faster, um, it, it, at least in, in the last 20 years, and going into, um, you know, going forward in the next 50, it's, it's going to be a lot more drastic of a change than it is between now and, say, Shakespeare. You know, I, I, I yeah. think that the internet and um, everything else has just, like, the interconnectivity has led to so much. Um, were you, was that your impressed face? Um, anyway, it, it was, um, 
uh, the interconnectivity of, of everyone and the speed with which we communicate, I, I think, lends itself to the spread of you know, neologisms and just all of these ways of expressing ourselves and, and modifying English. And of course, I'm sure that it works with other languages, but I only speak English because I'm an American and provincial and America. Um, <laughs> That was a great octave you found there near the end. I know. No, no, no. It's. I think you have to. You have to drop that. You know, <laughs> breaks the beauty illusion, but really, murder. You know? No, it doesn't break the beauty illusion at all. Um. But yeah, I guess that was a that was a bit of a tangent from a word nerd. Um. No, and I mean, I mean, I think I, I think you have an interesting point because it made me think about um. You know, I mean, you know me, I spend a lot of time in the video game sphere, and it made me think of, um, there is, you know, without getting too much into the whole, because people may not be familiar with it, the whole Xbox um, digital rights management thing that's been going on over the last couple months, um, I remember that um, Gizmodo, uh, Gawker Media's big technology tech head site, did this article, you know, um, lamenting how, um, you know, how they were taking away this service that they were focusing on how many things it added rather than most of the game community which focused on um, how many freedoms it took away. By the way, what's that loud sound? Say it again. Whoa. <laughs> did I just get really loud? Incredibly. How did you do that? I need to, I need to learn how to do that to scare people because it's very effective if that was the intent. I'm sorry. No, it's totally fine, but I just, like, like what changed in that time? Since this is live and all mistakes are in our faces. Yeah, I changed microphones, so I'm wow. going to change back. <laughs> <laughs> it was really great, too, because it had this, like, extremely creepy trash compactor from Star Wars A New Hope sound where it was just, like, gearing up, and then just, like, and then you talked, and it was, like, boom. Great. So, um... Everyone who is listening and complaining about my volume, um, those are your choices. <laughs> uh, but yeah, um, but no, it's just it's just interesting because um, you know the tech sector is really um, fixated on um, let's get the new technologies out there, and if there are problems, we can figure them out later. But let's just keep let's just like never like take any steps back or keep any technologies the way they were before, because essentially the way Xbox and PlayStation Four look now is the hardware and the actual user interface seem pretty much the same as they did with PS3 and Xbox 360, but their argument was at least Xbox was trying to shake things up, even though most of the policies they were enacting were making many, 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 many people angry. And I think that's why, like, I mean, that's why Google Hangouts kind of exists in the first place, is that we've gotten extremely addicted to how much, how much more things can we think of doing, because, I mean, that's so much what social media and app industry is about, is what is some teeny tiny thing that ever so slightly inconveniences or troubles us in the back of our little twisted brains and can we solve that and then can we draw attention to it in a way that's not so self-congratulatory that it's noticeable but not so small that you don't feel like we should be rewarded emotionally by either buying our stock or buying our wares when you notice it. So it's it's a very it's a very fun time we live in, and our kids will have it even more interesting in their kids after them. I think that's just the way. I think it got really geeky in here. I think that's what no. happened. No, not that. Take it back. Take it back. I refuse. She refuse. <laughs> <laughs> so you do know other languages in tiny. I do. I speak a little French. And and I can understand just a tiny bit of Spanish and Polish, but Ben. What? Vous êtes si gentil, ma chérie. I didn't say I was good at French. <laughs> <laughs> well, we can let anyone who understands French pick up on that one. Right. <laughs> okay, so um I did get one question, because I asked for questions beforehand, and all of you commenters were very unresponsive, and I'm looking at you, all of you. Um, but I did get one question beforehand that I thought was interesting, so I wanted to ask you. Um, 
the person posted on bygender.net, so, and they identify as bygender. Um, so the original question had to do with um, her and her girlfriend's potential future children. Um, her girlfriend doesn't want to inform the children, you know, rather than like expose the children. Um, she doesn't want to inform the children about it until they're older. Um, but uh, so, because presumably this person could present male and act as a father for the early parts of their life until they're ready to um, come out to their children. Uh, but you know, so you're but you're a trans woman. Like you are full time as a woman. You identify. You are woman identified, 100 percent of the time. You know, and and yeah. correct me if I overstate, but. Um, have you thought about when or how or if you will tell any children that you have in the future that you're trans and what that means and how to, you know, like, what's your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, it's a good question. And I think, I mean, I think I'd still maintain the policy that I have now where, you know, referring to myself in the past tense, I would stick with, um, I would stick with female pronouns. But I think, I think around... Maybe around the time they were, I don't know, I guess five or six maybe, I would want to talk to them about the fact that, you know, um, I mean, I would just want to be like, you know, Morgan was, you know, you know, or, or Mommy Morgan or Mom or whatever, you know, was, you know, a boy and she was very, very sad about that. And so she decided that she wasn't going to be anymore. And because um, I think I really don't want that to be the kind of thing I spring on someone when they're a teenager because, you know, they'll already be making up enough reasons to hate me. There's no reason for me to laden them with ammunition. And also, I wouldn't want the, someone else to figure out and tell them before me. And um, or just in general, just I mean, because they would obviously meet, you know, family members or friends and anyone could just slip up and that could just be confusing. And so I think. And I think, honestly, there's a lot of educational opportunities in explaining to someone, like, what it is I went through. And if no, if for no other reason, then you would be educating your kids, hopefully, to open up with you about things that are painful to them. Because, I mean, you know, you don't have to be trans to be pained by thoughts when you're a kid and never tell your folks about it because, you know, you think you're inconveniencing them. Because even when we're small, we're aware that our folks have money problems, they have relationship problems, they have, you know, just general frustrations and stresses. And oftentimes... It's just a temptation to just keep things away from them. And I think, you know, I would never, I would want to avoid, if at all possible, like my kid, like carrying some similar burden to the one that I carried and never let my folks into because, you know, all my imaginings of how that would end up were all bad. I mean, I just treated, you know, my secrets like berserk buttons where everyone was walking around and they were normal, happy, nice to meet people. And then the moment one of these got into the open, they would just switch into these angry people who are just going to abandon me, you know, and I mean, I carry that stuff with me, and I do my best with it, and some, and most days are good, but some days are not so, and I, you know, I just, I think, and, and of course, you know, it's a challenging thing for trans people to, you know, because to articulate, you know, your past might, you know, like, I mean, I'm comfortable with saying, you know, I was a boy, and I was very unhappy with that, but I know a lot of folks who are not, and I can totally see the challenge with wanting to educate your kids so that they understand the LGBT community and like and actually you know this reminds me I was we were doing a staff training about sensitivity to trans people a few months ago and I was like you know and I hadn't talked mostly during it because it was an outside group doing the presentation but I was like you know listen um, you can totally have conversations with your friends and family about gender and about trans people without citing me like there's no reason to out me to make any of your points to other people there's no reason to out me to have these kinds of conversations with people. And I think there probably is a way to talk with your kids about how it's okay to be trans and it's okay to be gay. It's just that I would, you know, I, I, I want my kids to know about my life, you know, and the continuity of my life. And I, if for no other reason, you know, there's, uh, there will be people who are in my life right now that will still be in my life then, and I just don't want anyone to find it out before I have the chance to tell them because you can't, you can't put that cat bat in, back in the bag. I mean, there's always going to be that thing where it may seem like, upon reflection, that I was hiding something. And I don't have anything to hide, least of all from the person whose life I was trying to stewardess. So that's me. That makes sense. And I actually am a parent, so I've had to navigate 
some of this myself. Um, unfortunately, I didn't know enough about myself. I didn't know as much about myself when I became a parent as I do now. So I think if I had it to do all over, I would handle it differently. Um, my ex-wife and I sat down and told our kids that I, um, I, the way I explained it was, um, you know, I have two daughters and we're sitting at the kitchen table and I said, you know how you have that little part inside your head that tells you that you're a girl? Like you don't really have to think about it. You just know you're a girl and it's not because I told you, it's just because you, that, you know that's what it is. They said, yeah. And I said, well, I have that too. Um, and, but I have one that says I'm a boy and I'm a girl. And they're both in my head. You know, I, I just know that both of those are true. And sometimes I'm more one than the other. Uh, my kids were almost five and almost seven. Um, and they actually were great. They handled it really well. And, um, you know, I told them they don't have to keep it a secret. I don't want them to feel like, you know, I'm anything for them to be ashamed of. Um, and that... Um, you know, I, I, but I did warn them, not everybody understands that. And so if you tell people, they may say things that sound hurtful, but it doesn't change the fact that I'm an okay person, you're an okay person, I love you, you know, we're awesome together, and um, it just means that they don't understand. Um, but it may not be fun to hear, so, you know, all of that's your decision. I really just did leave it up to them. My younger daughter has handled it, like, without a problem. She doesn't really blink, like, regardless of my presentation. Um, my older daughter, though, she's she's on the cusp of um, adolescence, of puberty. Like, she's becoming a woman. Like, she's she's really just sort of on the verge and trying to figure out who she is. So she's had a lot of difficulty trying to come to grips with there being a difference between you know, how I looked and presented before she knew about it and before I got divorced and you know now and you know now I'm on hormones and my presentation is definitely way more femme than um, it used to be <clears throat> so she's had to struggle a little bit with that and she's not told any of her friends my younger daughter I think has told a couple of her friends which is awkward because I don't know which ones <laughs> So you're always wondering? Always wondering. But, you know, when it comes to the kids and school stuff, it's always very boy presentation. Um, mm. Because I've not made any decisions about going, you know, full-time or seeking, you know, any further transition than where I am. Um, so there's no point in crossing that bridge until I have to. But um, I think if I, if I had understood myself at 23, the way that I understand myself at almost 35, um, I would have been honest and open from go. I, I wouldn't have hidden, hidden a thing. Because then I never would have had to feel like I was lying to my kids every day. I never would have had to feel like I had this big thing that I had to figure out how to tell them. It just would have been part of their normal. Um, and kids understand, they sort of pick up like what's culturally normative. Um, but it's heavily influenced by what is normative in their own house. So, um, you know, I think if, if I had not hidden sort of the femme side of me, they may have been surprised when they went to other kids' houses and their dads weren't in a skirt. Um, <laughs> but, more know, is their loss for it. Say that again? I said more is their loss for it. Seriously, because Breezy, hello. <laughs> um but I think that's a risk I would have, you know, been fine taking, you know, that that thing, they realize that things are different, you know, in different homes. Um, and there was a couple who had come to um, by gender.net, um, and they had they have uh, a young son, and and he was an infant uh, at the time that this couple joined. Um, the father is by gender and the mother is cisgender. Um, but they had a really cool approach, I thought. Um, they, 
had intentions, and, and I'm, I'm sure that they followed through at this point, but um, they had intentions to um, differentiate between private and secret, such that secrets are not good. So if somebody tells you, you know, you have to keep the secret from your parents, that's not allowed. Secrets aren't allowed. Um, because kids can't have secrets from their parents. It's not safe, right? But <laughs> private is okay. There is such thing as privacy. Um, there are things that happen, you know, in your home or with your family that you don't talk about with other people, but you talk about freely amongst your family because that's where it's, you know, that's safe space. So there's a, a, a real fine distinction between, or clear distinction between what's secret and what's private. And I thought that was a really cool idea to bring up your kids with. And um, <clears throat> my kid's a little older now, so, um, you know, the conversations that I have with them about secrets and privacy and that kind of stuff are on a bit of a different level. But I thought that was a really cool approach. And um, to the person who asked me the question, um, I would... Uh, your life is your own, of course. But I would suggest that um, you don't you don't keep a piece of yourself that you show the world from your kids. Um, you know, if you're if you are playing with gender because it's a private thing between you and your partner, then that's one thing. But if you are trying to build a life, um, you know, outside of your home in a different gender than, than what you're presenting at home, I think that it's going to be easier in the long run if that becomes normative early. Um, and, you know, and like you said, Morgan, there, there's the risk that somebody's going to say something to your kid before you deliver the message. And that's something that you don't want to happen because then there's a whole lot of hurt feelings and you're just transferring that shame from you and your childhood onto your child in their childhood. Um, so I, I think the more we can avo avoid putting shame on our children, especially for our own behaviors, um, the easier life our kids are going to have, and you know, maybe the world will be a better place. You know, and um, it's funny when you mentioned that example near the end about, you know, the part of yourself that you share with the world, sharing it with your kids, because um, you reminded me of a book I read. It, it was, I think it was about a psychologist who worked with a lot of trans patients. And um, I think they were citing some example where they were, um, like, the wife had found, um, and we're just, and we're just going with, um, we're just, we're just going with, oh God, I don't know. I'm going to get terminology all wrong all over the place. Of language. What? Yes, exactly. Thank you. I'm going to screw it all up. So now that everyone knows it in advance, I'm instantly forgiven, right? Anyways, exactly. so the wife found the husband's like, like women's underwear, and and he was like, and 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 he was like, no, no, it's it's okay. I'm not cheating on you. And then like, and then like, as they talked about it, she was like, well, yeah, you are, you are cheating on me. You're cheating on me with this other woman who is you that you're hiding from me, that you're that you're keeping from me, that you're sharing this entire life with that you don't include me in. And it's like it's like if you ever want to have like a full relationship with your kids, if you ever want to feel like your kids, you know, kind of understand you and by association you understand your kids, because I mean, if you share something real with them, you're gonna they're gonna you know, it's it's a it's it's you know, it takes two baby. And um yeah, no, it's just and, and and that's and that's of course the big thing. And it's of course, you know, from that example you'd be like, Well, why wouldn't you share? And of course, you know, you fear rejection, you fear loss, you feel you, you fear distance. And of course there's there's no shortage of examples online um, where people have just like, you know, lost their families um, over et cetera. But I mean, you know, you may be a risk adverse person, but I mean if there's one thing you've got to take risks with, it's the people who care about you the most. I mean, those are the people who are going to have some continuity about your life that you can go back to and talk to down the road. Those are the people who you're going to have the really meaningful fights with, the really meaningful fights that tell you who you are. And, like, if you can't, you know, I mean, eventually, you, the, the skeletons in your closet, your closet doesn't have as much room as you think it does. Not up in here and not out there. 
yeah. and the locks are never as good as you would hope. <laughs> that shit comes out. And then, you know, of course, the hinges are... No, wait, the metaphor is getting away from me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, he... I really liked your point, too, about... Um, you know, making sure your kids understand that if they have something that is different or that they fear is is different from expectation, that that's okay and that they can share that with you. And that only happens if they know that, um, or if you've shown them that it's okay to be different and it's okay to defy expectation um, and that you don't have to be ashamed for not matching up to some ideal that nobody matches up to. You know, and I, like um, my kids, you know, like my, like I said, my kids are, are 9 and 11. They're going to be 10 and 12 this year. Um, wow. oh, I, I can't even cope. You're like, you don't even know. Um, Congratulations but, uh, anyways. Oh, thanks. Um, but so we were like, we talk at dinner. We always have dinner together, um, which, you know, I think is important, but... You know, maybe it's provincial. I don't care. Um, we talk at the dinner table, and um, you know they're too young to date. They don't date right now, and they go to a small school, so it's not even like they have you know a large pool of kids who are you know pairing off or anything like that. There's like 30 kids in each grade, you know, um, and so they're they're not there yet. But whenever I talk about you know them dating in the future, I, I usually say, you know, oh, well, when you have a boyfriend or a girlfriend, if you date at all, you know, and the other day, my oldest daughter asked me, why do you keep saying girlfriend? Why would I date a girl? I was like, because that's not my decision. Like, I'm not the one who gets to, gets to say that you can or can't date a girl. Um, that's on you. Like, if you Decide that if you fall in love with a girl, then, then you fall in love with a girl. I don't want you thinking that I said you can't do it, you know? Um, so there's, I guess there's a point at which trying to be preemptively inclusive can be kind of annoying for a preteen. Sure. Um, but I'd rather err on that side. You know, I want them to know that they're always welcome to be who they are. And, and I've worked really hard not to be ashamed of who I am. I didn't do that work so that I could teach my kids how to be ashamed of who they are. Absolutely. And I think and I think the younger you are, the less you realize exactly how long life is. I mean, like, life is short. Don't get me wrong. Well aware. But life is also has so much more free time in it than you ever expect and has so much more, has so much, you know, if I add detail to it, I'm not going to say any more than I already did. But I mean, there's, I mean, but I think, I think we've all had that experience growing up where we realize that we actually have like a lot of ample time in front of us, and that we, every time we try to engage in a culture of certainty where we say out loud, "Oh, I'm this thing, and I'm going to have this thing by this age, and I'm always going to be in this kind of position, and I'm always going to behave in this way when this sort of situation presents itself," right? Like we feel compelled to say those things. Because we're hoping, it's a gamble, we're hoping we're going to be right later on, and then we can say, ha, see, I knew I was going to do this for 10 years, and I was right, and now I get a gold star. I mean, like, we really, really are hooked on this whole notion that if we're, if we're right about enough things early on and we stay right later, that we somehow won something. But I mean, like, I have screwed up so much in my life, and I wouldn't take pretty much any of them back. Like, I am... I am a richer person for my massive, massive, massive world-ending failures, and I, you know, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna ever pretend that you can't just drop the ball over and over again. And I, and I think, I think kids, you know, I mean, everything feels so big and urgent because they don't, as they understand how much, how big the world is. Their small world, when bad things happen, and it seems like they're breaking up their small world. Like things are so bad in my middle school now, or things are so bad in my neighborhood, or things are so bad in my after-school stuff. And I think you just got to, like, break that down and just be like, you know, like, hey, mom screws up four times a day before breakfast, okay? Oh, yeah. I, I, tell, I tell them all the time that I am very, very good at being wrong. Like, I have practiced <laughs> for years to perfect being wrong, and I'm pretty good at it. 
you know, because I, I want them to know that that people are fallible and it's okay to make mistakes and let that sort of inform who you are, you know. But you, you talk about there being a small world. I think that's completely accurate, and that's what leads to, you know, high school suicides and, um, you know, like the, the terrible situation with that kid in New Mexico who was getting bullied from age eight or something crazy, and, um, you know, just he couldn't take it anymore because, I mean, he was he was fifteen, sixteen, and, um, you know, he'd been getting bullied for half his life, like, he just couldn't fathom the fact that there was, that he wasn't even a quarter of the way done yet, like, you know, there was so much more, and once you get out of high school, you just escape all of this nonsense, and you find different levels of nonsense, but there's so much other good stuff to outweigh it, but, um, you know, this, exactly what you're talking about, like, kids who are young don't understand how long life actually is, and so, you know, everything feels so intense because the world is so small. Um, so I, you know, I think part of part of teaching your kids that you can be wrong teaches them that, um, you know, the stakes are not always as high as they seem on everything that happens. You know, um, and I think that we got way off the original topic. <laughs> that it was a bad thing, but um, hey, this is our rodeo. What's that? I said this is our rodeo. I think it's okay. That's true. That's true. And, you know, this is my shocked face about us going off topic. <laughs> um, see, this joke actually works now because, you know, I, I, I say that on the phone and it doesn't really play, but, you know, I can say this is my shocked face. Oh, uh, I'm sad I've been, like, hermiting, like, the last year or so ever since my website got taken down and I started working, like, 60-plus hour weeks. Oy vey. Do you want to tell people what happened to your website? I don't know. I guess you did make an I'm back post, but in case anyone's watching who hasn't realized that translabyrinth.com is, in fact, back. Yeah, and slowly getting back on its wheels. Um, thanks to Thanks solely to an international reader of mine who was like, I can fix your website for free. I can fix everything about your code that's wrong and I can protect it in the future and your videos were great and they helped me through stuff and it's the least I can do. Um, and uh, yeah, so what happened was this back in November, December, um, if people went to the site they would have seen like proxy gateway SQL errors or whatever and um, I tried to fix it by sending it back to a previous state, you know, like a few weeks ago and hoping that would solve it and it didn't and I was going through just so many other things in my workplace because, like I said, I was working tons and tons of hours, and it was all just... And eventually, like, the site got just... There was nothing when you went to it. It just looked like it had all gotten deleted, removed, whether it was hackers or virus or whatever. Um, and so... And I just, I just didn't know how to fix it. Like, I just had nothing I could do, and I tried reading up on it, but... I got the impression from some people that it could be like seriously badly infected, like get my credit card information, social security number, etc. So I didn't want to go back and experiment with it too much because I just was worried there would be consequences, so I just didn't do anything. And I just was wondering, I was like, oh, well, I guess that's it. Like I should like get a Tumblr or WordPress.com rather than a WordPress.org account so that they're responsible for fixing it, not me. Or just give up. And... Um, but, you know, this reader comes along, sends me an email, and, like, fixes the whole thing in, like, an hour or two, and then <laughs> they're phenomenal. They're like, I would love to upgrade the design of your website, too, just, you know, for fun. And I was like, I don't even know what to ask for. And they were like, I'm going to take some initiative, and I'm going to fix a bunch of things and give you a brand new website. And so now the website's new and does different stuff, looks better on mobile, it's, it runs fantastic, I'm working on some posts I'm putting together for it, and um, it'll all just kind of come piecemeal like it has before just because, you know, <laughs> Bren heard a lot about this before we started filming for this today, but there's just like 18 million things that happened between me and getting here to my computer, and my life is very, very typically like that. So I just roll with the punches, I do the best I can, and I try the best to give as much content when I do show up. So I love you all, and thank you so much for everyone who emailed and messaged, and your just general endurance for my hyphenness. Yeah. So go you. For all the people who are asking me where Morgan went, now you know. I found her for you, and she absolutely was not locked in my basement 
having psychological experiments done on her until Stockholm Syndrome took effect? No, I was locked in your basement doing very different things. <laughs> See? The dog didn't like it either. Rogue! Rogue! Pretty little dog. Um... Oh, so okay. actually, I got a question. Oh, I'm sorry, were you about to say something? I, yeah, I was about to tell you to vamp for just a second so I could get a glass of water and um, deal with the pup. Vamp. It's all on you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I actually... All right, I'm, I'm going to do video game things again, so everyone just plug their ears. Um, but I was playing Bioshock Infinite, and there's this great cover of Creedence Clearwater Revival's Fortunate Son. And so I always wanted to know how to sing... And so I have actually been like, it's like an acapella version by um, Jesse Carolina, that's her name. And, you know, I realized every time I've tried to learn to sing in the past, I've been picking songs that have, like, male vocals and stuff. And that's, that may seem like an obviously silly problem, but, like, I, you know, a lot of my favorite vocalists are male. So, but I've been working on this Jesse Carolina thing, which, of course, all this buildup, you would think, oh, of course, she's going to sing Fortunate Son now for us, for our amusement and enjoyment. But no, I'm not going to do that. I was just vamping with a carrot and a stick. Well, actually, I don't really even need to hold an imaginary carrot because I have the old head. And then stick, you know, here's a hand. What do you want from me? I might actually sing someday on a camera. I'm just telling you what you could expect maybe 5, 17 years down the road. So tell your children, keep an eye on YouTube in the future. I'm just going to sit here and see where this goes. No, see, you don't want to do that because people have tried that with me and... Some of my friends don't have, um, some of my friends' voicemail bo inboxes don't have time limits. And that's been a problem. Because I will talk, them. yeah, yeah, well, it's a great way to kill time, too. I can just piece out my thoughts, uh, on their voicemail inbox. Please talk about something, anything. I'm well, talking. you had a question for us. You had <laughs> one of your, one of your followers sent yes. something in. Yes, a friend of mine. Um... Can you talk about trans fashion sense and clothing choice and the adjustment to women's clothing? No, I can't talk about that. Oh, well, you know, I guess that's the end of the show. Brand, it's, it's been great. And, uh, you know, um, uh, we're here through Tuesday, only we're not. We're, we're closing the channel right now. I just need to find the exit button. Right, no, okay. So <laughs> the, the best expression I've, I've heard about... Um, uh, and I really, I know where this question comes from. Like, I, I feel like this question comes from um, so many trans women who come out um, later in life and are wearing clothes that are not appropriate to their body, not appropriate to their age, and, you know, they're shopping in the junior section, um, which is fine. I have a lot of juniors' clothes, goddammit, and I'm 35 years old, almost, and I defy you to take them away from me. However, um, there's a learning process, and, and the way that I've best heard this um, described was by a cis woman who was whose partner came out as trans. Uh -huh. um, and God love her, I have no idea who the source was. I don't remember. I just remember the phrase. Um, she said that... Um, if I had a $50,000 a year salary when I was 13 years old, I would have had a closet full of hooker boots, too. <laughs> Which, you know, I feel like there's some truth there. We have to go through an adjustment much later than... Okay. Oh, hi, dog. Hi, dog. Um... Dog we have to we have to learn all the things that you know cis girls learn or actually girl assigned people um, in early teens learn. They have to learn how to put you know outfits together. Um, they learn how makeup works. They learn how to play with their hair. They learn you know um, they make all of these mistakes. But like we were talking about, the stakes are much lower for them to make their mistakes, you know. They have parents who will tell them, you're not leaving my house dressed like that. Or parents who say, I, I don't know if this is a fashion thing, but honey, that doesn't look good. Um, 
and you know parents will say no I'm not buying that for you and instead you know we have to make all of these mistakes in front of the world <clears throat> because our world is much larger as adults and we there are a lot more people in our lives that we have to interact with um, you know over and over again and and we are going to make all of the same mistakes that you know some hypothetical 13 year old girl is gonna make um, until we figure it out or until our partner or our friends sit down and say oh honey no that's this this is not how this works you know this is not what looks good on you and let's go see if we can find something that you know looks better I, I think that's where that question was coming from and that's probably the best answer I have for that so um, my take on it is I think it depends on the level of involvement of other um, people in your transition because if you are if you are trying to build up a wardrobe and you are not getting input from anyone but your very possibly inexperienced self, um, it's, well, I mean, so how to, I mean, the internet is full of a lot of things, but how to dress like a woman in Google is going to get you some mixed results. And I mean, there's absolutely, there's absolutely conversation, there's absolutely articles about that for trans women and just in general online. But I mean, it's such like a big, a, a big, a big, vague space that it seems so impossible to surmount at the beginning that it seems more tempting to just kind of throw darts against the wall and see what works. I, I was really, really, really fortunate in that um, I kind of skipped some steps there that I think other people normally go through in that <laughs> my, my girlfriend, God bless her pee-picking heart, as my mom would say, she just went to thrift stores like a crazy person and then shows up at my house with these two giant trash bags full of clothes of just like, I mean, because like she knows, she knows what my size is, my size is about the same as her. So they're just filled with clothes, just pants, skirts, everything, everything. And so we just would have these like massive lengthy fashion shows with, you know, just me trying things on and seeing what works and I was just constantly getting feedback from her because she wanted it and she was happy to give it and so I um yeah so I just kind of like got grilled on how to dress that way in part and then also um again with the involvement of friends like I had friends who were extremely comfortable just like walking into the dressing room with me and like that was that was extremely soothing in the sense that like I could I could put on outfits around them and have them look at them and not feel incredibly uncomfortable or be wondering if they're thinking about, you know, like what's between my legs rather than what's covering them. And then um and then lastly, uh I also just kind of adapted some of my old fashion sense, but just, you know, more feminine, more me. So like this is actually a good example, but wasn't intentional. So I'm wearing like an overshirt, which is something I really love to do before I transition. And then I'm also wearing like a black shirt that's it's, it's a it's a disturbed band t-shirt. And like that's that's pretty indicative of mo most of my clothes were gray, black, or navy blue, and they usually just have like crazy designs on, on them. But you know now I'm also just wearing a skirt that I picked up real cheap, and now I have chain earrings rather than just you know shirts with chains on them. And so I just I mean, I think I think at the beginning when you're trying out your fashion sense, there's a temptation to go really far away from where it is that you start. And I think and I mean I think you kind of have to do that at the beginning because you really have a big desire to distance yourself from some of the things and some of the ways in which you are living your life. But I think, at least speaking purely from my experience, I kind of swung back towards the middle. So I got like a lot of like femme outfits, but then I started pulling myself back to more girl sizes of kind the kinds of clothes I would have bought before transition anyways because it's not like before transition I was just living a completely dishonest life and doing things the exact opposite of what I wanted to and every action of mine was an action that I hated like there were ways in which I found myself that weren't 
you know, they didn't complete me, but, you know, they certainly gave me one extra puzzle piece I didn't have to begin with. And, you know, they weren't, you know, there's no reason to throw out the baby with the bathwater. And, you know, some of those old shirts that I have are great sleeping shirts, you know, because they're gigantic because I weigh 30 pounds more. Um, so, yeah, I guess that's my sort of take on that question. I don't know if that was an entirely, like, answer in the sense that, but, I mean, it's just a question, so you just answer it how you answer it. Right, so I'm no. it. Um, I, I think from the perspective I was talking about, I think there's, there's a lot of temptation amongst trans women who grew up watching all of the girls around them wear all the clothes that they were jealous they didn't get to wear. And so when they finally have money and a reason to, or the ability to transition, it's, you know, it's time to finally get to do all those things. Um, <clears throat> which is why I have a uh, morbid fascination with bodysuits because I was in high school in 1994 and everybody had three of them except me and I was jealous. Um, I don't wear them because, um, there's a reason that not everybody is wearing them today. <laughs> it's awkward and uncomfortable. But, you know, I mean, like, there's still a fascination with that for me. Like, I didn't get to do that. That's what I got to see all the girls around me doing when I was young and trying to find my own identity. Um, I think I made a lot of those mistakes when I was dr dressing privately. Plus, the benefit I had was that I didn't have a lot of money because I had, you know, I was feeding a family of four. You know, I was I was the sole breadwinner for um, me and my wife and my kids um, because she stayed home to, you know, give the kids the life that we wanted to give them, you know. Um, but that didn't leave a lot of money left over for girl clothes. Right. So... Um, that was always sort of an unnecessary expense. So the few things that I bought that I really should not have bought um, were just expensive lessons and really never saw the light of day. So by the time that I was able to like be out and transition, um, you know, insofar as I have, um, you know, I, I sort of figured out for the most part what fits and what doesn't fit and what looks good and what doesn't look good on my particular body. Um, but, you know, that's a process we all have to go through, I guess. And it does help to have a lot of people who have sort of been through that help you, you know. Um, let's see. Uh, real quick, a couple of comments because our um, stream on the side there doesn't seem to be updating. Um, let's see. So when we went off topic, John Brokaw says that it may be off topic, but that was a wonderful conversation. That's because we're wonderful people. Um, uh, Wolf, who uh, asked the question about the kids, noticed Mumble in the background there. That's my girlfriend's. Um, let's see. Uh, there's some comments about our speaking. Uh, Mary Songstress says, I admit, Morgan, I was afraid your Facebook profile was affecting your job search and you were going underground. Um, let's see. That's not actually entirely untrue either, um, because uh, I was looking for work in more southern places than I'd lived before, and, um, you know, even though my full name is nowhere on my website, if you, when my website was around, if you typed my name into Google, it was the first thing that came up. It didn't matter that it was just through some juncture, through some junction or another, my name was on it, and so... That was um, also I was being stalked on LinkedIn um, because it, it shows you who looks at you and some of the people who were looking at me were yeah it just didn't make it worthwhile to be I was I was actually debating whether or not I would go back to doing anything at all if or if I would just like write a book and then that would be like the next time y'all saw me but um, I don't know there there's so many there's so many more people talking about the trans experience and so many more interesting people to interview now that I, I kind of want it back anyways. And besides, my users are just so sweet to just fix everything up for me because they wanted to see me do it again, and, and I missed it. And, you know, it also gives me a platform to go back to talking about video games or whatever the heck it is that comes to my mind from day to day. Well, we love you, and we miss you, too. Um, um, on a related note to that... Um, yeah, because you can see all the comments, and I can't, so I'm just totally going to well, depend on you. Well, what I ended up having to do was open up... Um, two tabs, one that has the YouTube um, video streaming, and then I just muted it. 
and another one on Twitter searching for the Bryn Live thing because this Hangout toolbox is not working as well as it did before. Mm -hmm. um, Sorry, that's sort of um, watching the sausage get made for people watching, but whatever. I don't care. It's not about you. It's about us. <laughs> Just kidding. It's all about you. Um, so Erica asks what you do for a living, if uh, that's something that you're comfortable sharing. It may not be, and that's okay. Um, <laughs> it's such a complex question you ask, because um, I've had so many... I've had so many jobs over the last few years, and oftentimes I was working three or four of them at once, or one of them was working me as much as three or four of them at the same time. So, um, you know, if I had an answer in the form of a career path, I would give it, but clearly I don't. <laughs> That's fine, um, baby. <laughs> I've done everything from waiting tables to... Um, accreditation at festivals to, oh gosh, I don't know. The list is so very, 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 very long. And you know, I feel like this is so perfect because I always, I always imagined I would end up being one of those writers who wandered around and had like a million random jobs before they actually figured out what it was they were doing. And you know, against all right reasoning and odds and to the shock, confusion, or blank faces of most everyone I know and love, I've actually been doing a lot of economics and accounting stuff recently that I find really, really interesting. Like, I was just reconciling uh, several thousand dollars worth of stuff before I came over here for an organization, and I was like, oh, that was so soothing, and I don't know why. I don't know why. I don't understand. I don't even... Anyone, anyone who claims to fully understand themselves is a bald-faced liar. That's true. And, I am included among that list. So You're drop in science, sister. <laughs> but you know, course, you know, don't forget your career as a calendar girl and um, camp counselor. <sighs> that was fun and great, and that actually makes really fun repurposed stuff in my resumes and cover letters. Like I just say, like, oh, I was a, um, I was a counselor, event organizer, and speaker on six panels at a popular international summer program. Bam! Nicely done. Because, <laughs> you know, no one ever asks me to clarify that. They're just like, oh, how interesting and important of you. And I was like, ching. Right. <laughs> uh, it's just, just a bunch of lesbians getting together and having fun. <laughs> Don't lie. <laughs> oh, my God. I have rarely had more fun in my life than at a camp. Folks, trans, cis, you know, but be gay. But, you know, go to a camp. Because, my God, A Camp, A Camp, Autostraddle, wonderful places, wonderful things. Um, A Camp was one of the best experiences I've ever had in my entire life, and I have made such great, supportive, wonderful, fun, amazing friends there. And I, I just, I'm, I'm a better person for having gone there, and I'm more capable of enjoying myself and my life because I went there. Like I just, it was like, it was like if you. If you had a bucket list filled with 50 items, and 10 of those items were just degrees to which you felt really special and important and loved and good and nice and warm and safe, it was like clearing out all 10 of those in one week. Like, I can't, I can't express it any better than that. Just, just go. Just do it. It's wonderful. They're great people. They will take care of you. It's a lot of fun. God bless every one of them. Sorry, I. Um, oh no, it's no problem. I have, I have my own audience over here. Down blouse shot. There you go. There you go. I was <laughs> with the dog. Oh right, right. The 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 mongrel. You suck. <laughs> She's very uh, confused by you. That's okay, cause so am I. Um, no, um, shit. <laughs> oh my god, could you say shit in that octave again? Because that was extremely pleasurable. What? <laughs> I don't even know. I don't. I can't even with you. Um, or just, or just say Pasquatank. Say Pasquatank. Schenectady. <laughs> You 
you know, for everyone who's watching, I want you to understand, this is how our phone conversations go, too. She just throws shit at me, and then I have nothing. I just, I blue screen, I have no response. I don't know what's going on. Um, I remember when I used to do it when you were driving, you would, like, miss turns constantly. It was really, it really became a small game of mine. I think you would, like, figure out my commute home, and, like, knew when I had to turn, so you would throw that shit. Um, no, you actually you actually caused a spit take. I, I don't know if you could see it in that little tiny screen at the bottom, but um, I did, I did. That's yeah. why I kept talking so that it wouldn't show up on the camera. Thank you, bless you. But I mean, you can't, say, you can't say whatever you do, be gay while I'm taking a drink. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, I didn't even notice that I said that. That needs to go on like a bumper sticker or something. <laughs> whatever you exactly. do, be gay. Also, this is, I think, what you would look like with a short haircut. You know, thank you. So this is the thing we were talking about before we started. Is like, oh my god. So my mm, mm, my girlfriend has pointed out that I should not get a short haircut, not because I wouldn't look good, but because if I thought I even slightly didn't look good, I would complain about it for however many years or months or whatever it would take for me to grow it back. And the puppy, I'm gonna stop talking. You start talking, so puppy goes on the camera. Um. Hi. <laughs> but no, please continue. <laughs> no, no, I'm just thinking about puppy. Um, but yeah, so I think I think it's I think it's really funny that I slowly like get a little less femme and a little bit more butch every few months. And like I would like there are so many alternative lifestyle like cute butchyish haircuts that I admire and wish I had the nerve to work up towards. But, uh, you know, then again, it's taken me so long to get these nice little locks of mine. I'm not so tempted to get rid of it yet. And people ask me when I'm actually going to cut it. I keep thinking about one of my best friends who is, is, is taller than me. He's about 5'10", and her hair, when I met her, was, was literally down to her ankles. Um, but but she, would, she would keep it up in a big, like, really nice, really elaborate buns that were just, like, like, really cute, and then she would let it down, and it was just, like, this waterfall of auburn hair just, like, rushing down her back, and it was it was a sight to behold, and I'm not saying I'm going there, but I'm not also doing anything to stop myself from going there. <laughs> hmm. I'm not. I'm not cutting my hair um, any shorter than it probably is right now, which is about, about the middle of my back, um, because I have an extraordinarily long face. Uh, which you may have noticed, um, but to um, to counterbalance my very long face, I also have very large ears. Um, so if I were to cut my hair too very short, um, it would just make me look extraordinarily male and like a taxi cab with the doors open. So this is pretty much exactly what I've always wanted my entire life, and I ain't getting rid of it unless I absolutely have to. <laughs> Well, I think you'd look cute, but you should do you. Oh no. I mean I would I would sort of love like a I would love to be able to put pull off like a cute little butchy haircut, like a like pink or something like that. Yeah. Uh, maybe some little sort of asymmetrical bob. But that's not happening. That's never gonna work. I believe in your capacity for whatever hair you dream of. I just don't believe in everyone's ability to get hired with every hair they ever dreamed of. That's true. I have been lucky enough to get hired uh, at three jobs with this haircut. So, uh, as a as a male, so that doesn't suck. Um, <laughs> but I, I work in IT, so you know, long greasy ponytails are sort of par for the course. At least. <laughs> At least mine's washed. <laughs> so, <laughs> Setting the bar real high today, Brian. It's yeah. true story. That's true story. Um, <laughs> so um, we've been on a bit of a geeky internet type bent tonight. Um, uh -huh. Zero thirteen Jane or at zero thirteen Jane, um, who has been a frequent commenter commenter on all of these Bryn lives asked, um, do the two of you think that the internet is the major driver in the rapidly changing attitude, attitudes toward LGBT people, or is society just growing up? 
Would you like to take that one first, or shall I? Um. I, well, I have an opinion. Um. I I think that at certain in certain um, social strata, that's absolutely the case, and that's why um, Gay Inc. is so successful. And, and by that I mean like um, HRC and all of these uh, organizations that have put the biggest focus on LGBT rights on marriage and not on um, the fact that 40% um, of homeless youth are queer. And when you compare that with the fact that only about 10% of the general population is queer, um, you know, that's a pretty striking statistic. And that all happens because um, people feel comfortable kicking their children out of their homes for being gay or trans or whatever. Um, but, you know, I think that, you know, lesbian weddings and uh, gay weddings make really cute pictures on your Yahoo feed, you know, while you're drinking your coffee in the morning. So it's really easy for HRC to push that stuff. Um, and get some traction, and you know their donors are largely um, well-off cis white men too. So you know that's their biggest um, constituency. I think that there has been some beneficial bleed over into the intersectional um, uh, queer groups, you know, people of color, and um, uh, trans folk, and, and that. But very little has bled over to, say, trans women of color who make up 90% of the names that we read every November 20th. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I think the internet has had some benefits, but it has not had equal benefits. Um, when you're looking at something like, like gay marriage or um, um, some of the more middle class type rights, that that um, we're looking for or, or support. Um, the internet has had a, a great deal to do with that. Um, I think some of the success of ENDA in the um, finally moving through Congress, we don't have a vote yet, but you know, there's actually a chance that there will be a vote for the first time in a decade. Um, some of that comes from the presence of LGBT, LGBT people uh, on the internet and showing up in um, you know, Huffington Post or um, Google News or just all these places that people check um, in the morning without doing any real deep news diving. Um, but I think that outside of maybe Tumblr, there's not a lot of focus. Sorry, your fan just kicked on. There's, there's not a lot of focus on um, the desperately underserved um, aspects of the LGBT, LGBTQ community, um, specifically in people of color. And, and um, Jen Richards from Chicago, the one who put together the Trans 100 list, um, or one of the two people who founded the Trans 100 list, um, on her podcast with uh, Bailey J, she says, I don't think we can talk about, I don't think we can legitimately talk about equal rights if we're not talking about race. Like, um, the fact that all of the advancement is, has been happening to middle class and upper class white people and we are just leaving our um, uh, people of color, like our, our women of color sisters behind is just shameful and I think that it's not something that's part of enough conversations. So uh, I guess the answer to what is really an innocent question is um, Yes, I think the internet is a driver in the rapidly changing attitudes. I don't think that it is um, as transformative as it could be because there's there's um, uh, access problems too. Like there's there's a whole group of people who don't have access to the internet to learn about you know to learn the fact that they're not alone if they're young and queer and of low you know in a low income. Um, strata like there's they don't have the opportunity to see that other people feel the way that they feel and I think that if we really want the internet to be as transformational as it could be then we need to work really hard on increasing the level of access 
that all Americans have to this humongous resource. I mean, it's like an external brain drive um, for anybody who has access to Google, and there's people who don't have access to it at all. And so all of those people that they interact with likely also don't have that same access. So their attitudes aren't changing because they don't know that they're quickly becoming the minority in public opinion, you know? So I guess I had a Yeah, and I mean, I, no, you totally should. This is the place. Um, and, you know, I was thinking about what you meant. <clears throat> I was thinking about what you were saying about, you know, quote, unquote, gay ink. And I think, um, I think, you know, absolutely, I think internet culture is, you know, no pun intended, help sort of engender a lot more acceptance just because, you know, you can take things like the LGBT acronym and boil down the entirety of so many different groups and of people's experience into a four-letter acronym. And, you know, I have to say, while that does throw most of the nuance out the door, it has a lot of value in the sense that it travels really, really easily. Because, like, LGBT is, like, support LGBT people is a lot easier to move a lot quicker than it is like, well, so here's the different ways in which bisexual people should be supported as in respect to people who identify as, you know, gay or lesbian or, you know, like, like you're, you're forcing a lot of conversations onto an audience that doesn't, I mean, it's, okay, so, so people frequently get upset with Americans for not being as involved in the world around them, but... Americans are constantly beset by multiple different groups who have lots of advertising venues, whether it's the internet or television or people on the street or whatever, to say, hey, look at this need you're not fulfilling. You should donate money to it. You should donate attention to it. You should rally for it. You should put your time into it. Like, Americans have that all the time, and we're told, you know, because we're, because we're such a powerful country, we have a responsibility to whatever X, Y, or Z causes, and no one can... No one can hold all of those into their head. No one can understand all of them. No one can exhaustively talk about every single issue and point that every different group thinks is the most important point going on in this culture right now. Like some people will tell you that internet security is our biggest problem. And some people will tell you that a lack of understanding of racial equality is a problem. And a lack of and some people will say that the two-party system isn't working. And some people say that our entire economic structure has been screwed from the beginning, that we keep the U.S. Postal Service around. And it goes on and on and on. And every one of these people express what their going concern is as the most important thing that's going on. And people can't differentiate between those. And people are doing good just to remember the titles, the headings, of whatever it is that is supposed to be this important. And so LGBT is great as an acronym that travels because it moves around really easily and if you want to do more research you can. So I mean I totally understand busting things down to its simplest possible molecules to get a voice out there because after Obama got elected like it's I feel like culturally it's it's like it magically went away that time period in our lives that I remember being most of my life where if you even insinuated someone might be gay let alone just saying oh do you think that person's you know, like, like, do you think that person's checking me out because, by the way, I'm gay? Like, these things, these conversations did not happen. It did not happen in most spaces. You could not suggest someone was gay, except in, like, a humorous, derogatory context. That was the only way that it was acceptable. No one talked about it. No one discussed it. It was just those group of people who have AIDS. Oh, wait, maybe they don't anymore. I don't know. I haven't looked into it. And so, you know, I mean, I feel like the Internet, the Internet lends itself because it's so unregulated and we would all like to keep it that way, that's a little bit of my own feelings about other causes in which the world should care about seeping through. But the reason it's great is because it lends itself to niche culture. And so, you know, um, if I want to look into the experience of transgender journalists in the video game, I know that. Because the internet has infinite space for infinite kinds of thoughts. And so I think, it's, I think it's been great because it's a resource that so many people have access to that can offer such nuance and wide opinions. I mean, before, the way we thought of his history and the way we thought of his information is everything that we got in school or that was available at our local library, and that was, all, that was where all the truth lived, and there was no extra truth. And now the exact opposite is happening, and every moment of every instance of every nanosecond is being stored for better or for worse on the internet. 
And so I think it's great. I agree. Oh. Um, <clears throat> she froze for me, so I hope I'm not talking over her for everybody else. Um, uh, I'm not great at vamping. I made vamp, uh, Morgan vamp for um, a number of minutes just so that I could quench my thirst, and I actually don't have What did uh, you say? Anything. Oh, my God, she's back. You froze. You froze. You were talking, uh, well, at least for me. So hopefully everybody else I did. hear all of your wisdom. Yes. Um, oh, that's funny, because you froze on my end. Huh. Well, we froze. <laughs> How long was I frozen? A um, few seconds? Fifteen? Um, you were talking about how um, there's infinite amounts of truth now. Like, the truth is not just um, uh, finitely contained in the library. And, um, you know, there's there's room for everybody to have a voice and um, and find information on the Internet. It's your lord. I think she's frozen again, or else I'm frozen again. Um, that's unfortunate. Mm, people. Um, okay, well. Yeah, there. It's by text. Are you there? Are you there? So much freezing. That's unfortunate. Because you're so wise, and you were dropping science. See, I can only ever hear you in bits and pieces, and I'm guessing you're getting the same from me, if anything at all. No, actually, I hear, I'm hear i hearing all of you now when you're not frozen, so... Um... <laughs> Is that just your new expression now? When you're not frozen? Oh, dear, there she goes. Okay. Um... I don't know if she's going to come back, people. I hope that she does. Um, but I, I guess, um, you know, she's right. Like, there's there's some value in having um, some kind of unified name of the LGBTQ community, being able to pass that information, you know, or pass that, I, that information as an idea to other people and sort of infect their brains with Hi. the idea that... Hi, welcome back. Um... <laughs> So I was saying that, that I agree with you that there's some value in lumping everyone together under this LGBTQ banner because it, it provides a nice little um, infection vector to getting into other people's heads. Like when they when they see you know this this acronym show up, then they're likely to throw it into Google and see what happens. My worry about it though is that um, there's a lot of focus on the G, like a really lot of focus on the G and almost as much focus on the L. And then the other BTQ just sort of gets like lumped in as like varying shades of gay. Like 50 shades of gay. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Thank you. Um, but uh, so, you know, I, I do worry that um, our movement is not ours and that it's it's sort of owned by other people, and and it perpetuates this notion that being trans is just really, really gay. Um, but, you know, I think the internet has gone yeah. a long way. Like, the fact that you and I and so many other people are able to put our videos up on YouTube and just shout to the world that, hey, this is me, and this is this is how I define myself, and this is, you know, the flavor of my life. It might match yours, and if you're at all like this, then maybe there's this area you can, you know, look into to help put a label around yourself and, and find language that you didn't have to describe an experience that you've been um, blindly having or, you know, struggling to to elucidate, you know. So I think that is, is fantastic, and I think YouTube is one of those um, pieces of the Internet that's far more accessible than, um, you know, like... TS Roadmap is great, and it's one of the first things you'll find when you look for transgender minus porn. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, not everyone's going to find that right away, and I think it's a lot easier to get into the 
different experience section of YouTube? Is that a polite way of saying that? Like, if you hang out on YouTube and watch enough videos, you're going to find the weird corner of YouTube. And sometimes that's where we live. And, and people are going to chance across our videos. And maybe amongst, you know, uh, the 50 people who would be more inclined to post man on my video or troll from 4chan, there's one person who can hear me say something and go, oh, holy shit, like, that's that's me. That's what I've been feeling. Um, or, you know, you or Tranny Star Galactica. And she's gone. Do you see that? She just vanished. Like a ginger ninja. A ginger. ginger. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm so glad your brain is as broken as mine and went there, too. Oh. I was hoping you would just not mention that I had suddenly had to disappear. People can see it. They can see the little... You're, you're right, you're right um, there. Oh, wait. So, okay, so I actually, since I've never done one of these before... So, um, oh, okay, I understand now. I got you. Oh my god, is my phone? Oh yeah, my phone's not dead. Sorry, it was in the monsoon and I realized it's been sitting in the dusty rice too long and that would actually probably break it further and I was like, oh crap, must go rescue. Oh, I heard it was supposed to be left overnight. Um. I don't know these things. You know what? I don't either, but whatever. <laughs> yeah. But it, it works, it's alive. So that's, that's yeah. helpful. Yeah. Sorry for interrupting your train of thought, love. No, you were fine. Um, I, it's derailed. I don't know. It, maybe it pulled <laughs> into the station. I hope I reached a conclusion. I don't remember a damn thing what I was saying. Uh, but I was really proud of Jinja, so... Yeah, and so as long as we ended on that high note, I mean, that's the most important part. And actually, speaking of ending, it is now 9.33, 10.33 your time. Um, and, you know, I think that probably we have forced these poor people to watch us talk long enough. Um, but, you know, an, an hour and a half, I think, is, is uh, how long we've been going. Um, so I think that's, that's a pretty respectable amount of time. And I hope that this was as fun for you as it was for me. And I hope that you will come back and do this again because you are fantastic and I love talking to you. Mm, thank you. And thank you so much for having me on. I really appreciate it. All right, everyone. Thank you for your comments and tweets. And um, I am sorry if I didn't get to anybody who had asked a question. I tried, but um, it was, uh, uh, I don't know. The Google Hangouts has this little toolbox thing that gives us our stream, and it's always worked pretty OK, and it just stopped. So I've had to bounce all over the place, and it's not been easy for me. But um, and we did have some technical interesting moments. Um, but I'm glad that you stuck with us. I, uh, I, I know there were some people in the UK, actually, who, there was someone in the UK who had stayed up until 2 a.m. to watch this. Oh, my God. Thank you. And I mean, thank you to everyone, but especially thank you to you. Okay. <laughs> I, what'd you say? Did you say Ted? No, no, no. I said, I said, I said, and thank you to you. Dot, 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 K. Oh. Da -dun, dun 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 Yeah. Okay. I'm just going to go with the fact that since it's 2 a.m. your time, that's the best humor I can do at 2 a.m. and use that as my excuse. That sounds good. I'm sure. I think so. I mean, frankly, I think we probably put them to sleep. But that's okay. Anyway, yeah. I, um, I am really glad. I love that, um, you know, we had participation and that um, people were here and having fun with us. So, yeah. Um, I actually do want to do more Bryn Lives. Um, and actually, this is this is um, a segment I've been wanting to do on my channel, uh, which is really more of the Brinter view. Um, oh, yeah. Brinter view. <laughs> it's going to be a thing. I love your brain so much. I know. <laughs> Sometimes I'm just really Brintense. Um, Let it go. Let it go. Let it go. <laughs> <laughs> don't change a thing. I love you. Oh, if I don't talk, then you don't get to see my little smile? No, um, I totally do. Okay, so I was signing off. But, yeah, um, thank you, everyone who joined us. Thank you, everyone who commented. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you to Morgan, who... Um, 
walked through the rain to come here tonight, people. Be grateful. I think you should understand what she had to go through to get here for your entertainment. And I hope you were entertained. I was, and I'm not going to share that whole story because there's enough woe is me stories in the world. But, uh, <laughs> you know. Oh, I would also like to point out that she walked through the rain for a half an hour, and she looks that great. I worked on this for like an hour and a half because I was actually nervous about being on here, and I just didn't want to get outclassed. And you came in, you were all soaking wet, and then all of a sudden, bam, beautiful. And there you go. I don't know why I bothered. I never had a chance. You're lying. You're lying. And you never give yourself enough credit. You it's gorgeous, true. gorgeous thing, you know. Oh, please. Please. <laughs> stop. Stop. Please. You're a little fishy. Yeah. Uh -huh. You're a little uh -huh. fishy. <laughs> you're damn right. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are actually done. Thank you so much, and I hope you had a great night. I hope you have a great night. Thank you, everyone, for coming. We really appreciate it. Have a wonderful evening.